so excited. Hey, listen, you all are here for for school and for class, and I am here to teach because I got something to tell y'all about this Holy Ghost. <laughs> Oh, I got something to tell y'all about this Holy Ghost. Somebody put that in the chat. This Holy Ghost. Oh, glory to God. This Holy Ghost. Listen, Pentecost is a worldview. Pentecost is a worldview. What is a worldview? A worldview uh, is, is how you see things through the lenses of how you see things. All right? And so when... when <laughs> So y'all don't see these chats, but my sister, Dr. Jessica Ingram, <laughs> spirit, spiritual director. She, she's, she's, she's a red and white lady. <laughs> so she just put in the chat, Pentecost is red. Okay, praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We love God. We love each other. Amen. Over here in the School of Holy Spirit, we love each other. Come on, let's like, tag, and share. And those of you that are on Zoom, those of you that are on free conference call, please tag somebody now and let them know you had an assignment today and that was to bring three people into the class. So tag your people. Let's get them in class. Class is growing. Class is growing, 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 growing. Last 28 days. 92,000 people reached last 28 days. So class is growing. Class is growing. I love algorithms. I love data. And so the last 28 days, people are clicking, people are viewing, uh, whether they view for five minutes, 10 minutes, we are making a connection with people who want to know more about Holy Spirit. To all of our pastors and our senior leaders that watch and take notes, send me that time. <laughs> Send me that time in Jesus name. Hey, listen, I am so excited. Pentecost is a worldview. What is your worldview? Is your worldview scripture? Is your worldview scripture? What is your worldview? I want you to write that in the chat. I want you to ask yourself, what is my worldview? What is my worldview? W-O-R-L-D-V-I-E-W, one word. What is my worldview? And so uh, shout out to uh, the shirt shop that uh, makes some of our shirts. Uh, uh, Sunrise, they, this, this shirt came from that shop. Pentecost is a worldview. It'll be available at camp meeting August 4 through 7 here in Detroit. What is my worldview? John, John, Andrew, and yes, Omega, yes, Kimberly, get them all in here. <laughs> Drill, come on. I got all my waiters. God bless you. Uh, Barbania, Houston Black, Tiara Jones. Hey, Rose Austin, Adrian Lawrence, Diane Jackson. Hey, Sugar Bertha Davis. Yes, what is my worldview? Dr. Miyoshi Schneck. 30 years, my God, what is my worldview? Uh, Patricia Dorsey, God bless you, Carter, congratulations. I am Nia Shabazz. Yes, I am Little Wilson, all of my union family, uh, Pastor Hillary Gardner. What is my worldview? What is my worldview? Thank you, Mama Pearl, we're expecting good news. What is my worldview? Now you gotta stop and think about it. What is my worldview? Is my worldview culture? Is my worldview my own opinions? Or is my worldview scripture? What is my worldview? Uh, good morning, Chris. Chris, Beverly Callum. Yes, yes. Uh, Sandra Coleman. Yes, I am Mia Shabazz. Thank you. What is Charlene Legon, Pastor Ingrid Ingram? What is my worldview? Uh, the other day we had um, uh, at school board story time. I always have to tell you a little story. And <clears throat> listen to me. I am an, I am as inclusive as anybody. I need you to understand that. I've been dealing with uh, inclusivity for years because I was excluded being a female preacher. And I know that being excluded is not God's will. It's not God's will that we exclude people that we necessarily don't agree with. It's not our, it's not our job. It's not our right 
to exclude anybody, to mistreat anybody, to marginalize anybody. That's not what we do as believers. And if you have the right worldview, you'll understand that every person created is created in the image of God. We are all created in the Imago day, the Imago day, which is <clears throat> the image of God. We are all created <clears throat> in the image of God. We are all created in the image of God, the Imago day. And so I, I am 150% a preacher of inclusion. If you come to the cathedral, on the front of the cathedral, it says Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost Cathedral, a church for all people. All right. So I don't preach a marginalized gospel. I don't preach a theology that eliminates people based on race, gender, or orientation. I never have. I just preach what the word says. <clears throat> And so the other day, uh, as a school board member, one of uh, the issues that came up uh, was a resolution uh, that would acknowledge Pride Month as a district. And so uh, when, I, when I saw the resolution, I will admit, I didn't get a chance to look at all my notes prior to the board meeting, graduations, uh, initiations, all of this was going on in and dissertation. <laughs> so uh, a lot's going on with the bishop. So I didn't get a chance. So I'm sitting at the table reading. I'm already late. I was at a graduation and I was already running behind an hour for the meeting. So I sit down and I'm at the table and I'm reading my board docs. And oh my goodness, I've not seen this resolution. And prior to this, there might be some discussion that this is coming up on the agenda. It did, I didn't I didn't get the call and I didn't read it. Uh, so Holy Spirit said, open it up. So I open it up. Holy Spirit is just, you know, time, you need to look at this. So uh, I opened it up and it was a resolution uh, to declare that June of 2022 is Pride Month for this for the district so my question you know, was there any questions on the motion so why do we need to do this because i know we have transgender children i know we have uh gay children i know we have bi children i know that we have children in our district staff in our district that identifies with all of those letters you have never had no problem with me i love all of y'all and i'm gonna treat you equally i'm never gonna marginalize you upon the confession of your mouth never that's never going to happen. I've never done it. And so when the when when it was about to go to motion, Holy Spirit said to me very clearly, that's a no for you. Now, you that, that's very rare for me. I'm, I'm not the person that votes uh, resolutions down. I, I don't have to agree with it. But my president and, and the board, they, they're, they're rational, godly people. Holy Spirit said, that's a no for you. I said, no. Now, you've got to understand, there's seven of us, so it takes four to make a quorum. And at this particular meeting on Tuesday, there was only four. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, this is this one vote can turn this, but that wasn't my idea, my worldview, my worldview. So I said, well, we have observations, we have different things that are going on. Do we need to do this as a district? Uh, to marginalize others because this marginalizes others. Do, so do we need to do this? Are there celebrations? Are there observations? Yes, there are. Then why do we need a resolution? So I'm, I'm asking at the table because I haven't had a chance to discuss it. <clears throat> so the vote comes around and I vote no. And the resolution fails because there's only four of us there and the resolution fails. Now, let me just say this to you. This has nothing to do with my understanding of homosexuality. It has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with me not loving and, and, and having wonderful, wonderful, wonderful relationships with people who identify with those letters. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with my worldview. 
All right. It has to do with my worldview. So, of course, I get a couple of calls afterwards and people say, I, I can't believe that you that you voted that down. I can't believe that you voted that down. I said, I can't believe you thought I would, <laughs> that I wouldn't. <laughs> and so the constituency of people that I represent, the people that voted for me, because I'm not a part of a union, I'm not a part of anything, are clergy, church people, spiritual people, and not just church like we know it, but Muslims, rabbis, imams. I represent a community at that table that had no voice. So that's why they voted for me. So the constituent, let me take you to school, the con constituency of people that voted for me, because I'm not union, I'm not AFT, DFT, I'm none of those things. I am C-H-U-R-C-H. -H. And so that's the constituency that I represent. And that's my worldview. What is your worldview? See, June is already National Pride Month. We're already celebrating it. It's already a part of our culture. So why do we need to declare it in the district? So you, you're going to have those moments where Holy Spirit is going to attach itself. <laughs> uh, Holy Spirit is going to attach itself to your knowledge of God. Somebody write that down. What is your worldview? Where do you glean your worldview from? Do you glean your worldview from scripture? Or do you, do you gather your worldview from culture? All right? And so it, it was just amazing to me. A board member called me and others uh, reached out to me and said, oh, we're just surprised. Now, there are other quote unquote Christians on the table. They represent different constituencies. But I just say to one, let me remind you who I am. I am Bishop Carlotta J. Vaughn. I am a bishop in the Lord's church. And I represent a constituency of people who believe a certain way. And I represent them, not in hatred, not in marginalization, but this is a school district. Our job is to educate. What is your worldview? And sometimes Holy Spirit is going to ask you in a, in a quickening, in a, in a very quickening of quickening. So Holy Spirit has to attach to something. Holy Spirit will not attach to your emotions. Holy Spirit must attach to something in order for us to be guided by Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, what does Holy Spirit attach to in you? All right, this is, this is, we put your waiters on because uh, this is apostolic. <laughs> what is my worldview? And you will never see Bishop Vaughn marginalized or treat anyone that's not me over the years. My first son, uh, Pastor Prophet Keith Grayton. I walked with him for years while he was in that lifestyle. Uh, that lifestyle is not foreign to me. I'm very familiar, but it's no different than any other thing that people have to work through. So I don't marginalize, I don't penalize, I don't do any of that. But as an elected official, I need to make decisions based on a biblical worldview. What is your worldview? What is your worldview? And you have to ask a question. Asia, what is my worldview? Dr. Anika, what is my worldview? Pentecost is a worldview. What is my worldview? Uh, is, is, my, is my worldview culture? Or is my world, if someone said, uh, <laughs> uh, somebody said, um, uh, you know, we, 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 this is an election year, you know, and I was like, I have no, I have no concerns about that. Uh, God spoke to me and said, I put the church in that seat. When I won, he said, I put Holy Spirit. God spoke to me and said, I put the church in that seat. Good morning, Pastor Colbert. Good morning, Donnie. Good morning, Rose. Good morning. I put the church in that seat. 
And I said, yes, Lord. I put the church there. So what is my worldview? Boaz, I see you in two places. Thank you. Shell Laidler. What is my worldview? Now, if my worldview is not the knowledge of God based on the revelation of God, then what does Holy Spirit have to work with? Okay, what does Holy Spirit have to work with? <laughs> Whoa, now, when we talk about Holy Spirit in these mountains, of culture. We talk about mountains of culture, education. We talk about the mountains of culture, entertainment, arts, media. Think about family. We think about all of that. What is your biblical world or what is your worldview when you get into these mountains of culture? If you're going to be an elected official and we've got to do it for the people we Okay. What is your worldview? So what is a worldview? A worldview, Patty Jones, is the, are the lenses the lenses that I look through, this, these glasses help me see. And I know, I know I got a lot of them because I need to see. All right. So these glasses, if you think of them as not glasses, think of it as my worldview. My worldview are the lenses that I look through. The lenses that I look through. Okay, and so I have to know what my worldview is. My my worldview needs to be God's view. Somebody write that down. My worldview needs to be God's view. My worldview needs to be God's view. And so my worldview are the lenses that I look through. How do I see the world? What are my filters? Okay. What are my lenses? What are my lenses that I see the world through? Okay. That is what a worldview is. How do I see the world? What are my filters? What are my lenses? that I see the world through, that I make decisions, that I navigate my life, that I get into relationships, that I, that I create my wealth streams. How do I navigate my life? You will navigate your life through your filters, through your lenses. How do you see the world? <laughs> and so as a spirit baptized believer, my behavior, my way of thinking, my pedagogy, my applications of life and culture needs to be through the view that God has. I need God's view. Somebody, somebody, somebody write that down. I need I need, okay, somebody write that down. <laughs> I need to see things the same way that God sees them. Are you hearing me? <laughs> oh my God. And there's no, there's no alterations. There's no modifications. If you know God, I need to see things. The way God sees things. Ooh. <laughs> Somebody grab that. I need to see things the way that God sees them. What are my filters? What are my lenses? Now, this is much bigger than just knowing the Bible, knowing scripture. This is about how well do I know God? How well do I know God? How well do I know God? And so again, I will repeat that this book is not for you to read to live a better life. This book is not for that. 
This book is not for you to prosper. This book is not for you to be a better person. This, that's not the purpose of this book. And biblical instructions for, for what is that? Uh, B-I-B-L-E, biblical instructions for something earthly living or something like that when we were kids coming up in Sunshine Band. But that's not right. That, that's not right. This, this Bible is about God. And when I read it, I need to read it for the revelation of God. I need to know God before I know me. I need to know God before I get married. I need to know God uh, to prosper. I need to know God to live upright, to be a better person. I need to know God first. Because if I don't know God first, then I'll put me first. And my emotions, my opinions, will become my worldview. Woo, is anybody with me? I need to see things the way God sees things. Woo, Holy Spirit has been given to us to help us see things the way God sees things. I need to see things the way God sees things. And the only way I can see things the way God sees it is I got to know God. I got to know God. Not my mama's God. Not my daddy's God. Not my grandmama's dad. I, I, not my pastor's God. Not bishop's God. I need to know this God for myself. Because if I don't know God for myself, I will not see things. I will modify. I will enculturate. I will modify. I will enculturate. I, I, I will deviate from a biblical worldview. And I will deviate from Pentecostal worldview. I, I, I'll, I'll, get, I'll make my own. What is your worldview? How do you see things? What do you use to make your decisions? What, what are your boundaries? Hey, Wendy, God bless you. Prayed all day. Woo, glory to God. What is my worldview? Now, and, and, and in this class, come on, <laughs> come on, Marcus. Ah, ah, well, I need a camel. Let's go, let's go. Put your waiters on, put your waiters on. You cannot live by bread alone. You cannot live by bread alone. You cannot live for sermons. You cannot live on week-to-week -week Bible study. You cannot live on your prayer life. You have got to know God. What do I use to sift my decisions? What do I use? Do I use my opinions? Do I use my emotions? Am I persuaded by media? Am I persuaded by what? What do I believe? What do I believe? And when you are in the world, you're going to have encounters with different people who have different worldviews. If you run into a true Muslim, the Quran. The Quran, the Quran is going to be their worldview, unless there's another sect, a different sex. They have a worldview. Some of them don't even know the Quran. Farrakhan is their worldview. Same way in the church. People in the pew don't have a, a, a biblical worldview. The pastor is their worldview. The people, the person that preaches to them is their worldview. Oh my God. Woo, resh katarada bahashka. Martha Bonk says, uh, wow, course correction. Uh, reading the Bible to know God changed. Absolutely. That's the only reason you should be reading the Bible. If you're not, if you're not reading the Bible to know who God is, then you should you should don't even read it. Don't don't read it to preach. Don't don't read it. No, read it 
for the revelation of God. Now, Holy Spirit must have something in the believer's life, a core belief that Holy Spirit will help or will, will exponentially grow or expand on. And the reason that we have trouble with Holy Spirit, the reason that we are still claiming certain things in our lives, in our bodies, we're still identifying with diabetes, still identifying with sicknesses and diseases of the body, of the mind, of the emotion. We still identify with that because that's your worldview. But when you come to know God, Jessica Grant, when you read the Bible just for the revelation of God, your worldview will change. Your lenses will change. <laughs> Woo, listen, listen. And the only way you can know God, people say, well, you, you learn God through your experiences. No, that's not how you learn God. You don't learn God through your experiences. No, no, no. You don't learn God through your experiences. You learn God through the revelation that he has put before us. There's only one way that God has given us to know him. And it's in the revelation of his word. It's in the revelation of his word. Seven years. Seven years of reading the scriptures every day. It wasn't about stuff I agreed with or stuff I didn't agree with. It wasn't about whether or not it was hermeneutically sound or uh, politically correct. It wasn't about any of that. Listen to me carefully. When I started reading the Bible, just reading it, not studying it, but just reading it at the end of seven years, around that November, every day, Holy Spirit said to me, do not study, read it. Don't use notes. Don't go any place. <laughs> don't, don't, don't search out a word. Learn the word. Let me teach you the meaning of it. Don't use a dictionary. Don't use a concordance. Don't use anything. Just sit with me and read my word. Just read. Don't try to, ex don't try to understand. Just read. Let me teach you. And at the end of seven years, Monday through Friday, reading the scriptures every single day, Holy Spirit said, close it. At the end, of, it was about November of that seventh year. So you can close it now. Close it. And I closed it. He said, I have reformatted your mind. Whew, every time I think about it, I have reformatted your mind. Now, at that time, I had no idea what that meant. I reformatted your mind, no idea what that meant. Because we are not aware of our biases. We're not aware of our lenses. We're not aware we can preach exp, exp, expo, uh, exponentially well. We can, that, that's another word I want, extemporaneously. That's the word I want. We can preach, except we can preach the scriptures extemporaneous, not even having a biblical worldview. <laughs> Woo! Don't highlight, don't take notes, don't do nothing. Just read it. You know how difficult that is. You know how difficult that was for me? Because I go to the Bible with notepad and phone, you know, at that time, microphone and recorder and markers and, you know, highlighters. I said, no, don't take nothing. Just take this book and read it. Read it. <laughs> read it. Just read. And anything you don't know, I'll teach you. Don't read any commentator. Don't read any annotated notes. Don't go, go to the back. Don't search nothing. 
just read. Every day. <laughs> Thank you, Leon. That's the word I'm looking for. Extemporaneous. Preaching from the heart, but not preaching from the text. Because you don't really know. And we're good at that. And people like it. People come for it. I said, don't do nothing. He said, don't mark. Don't underline. You don't need a pen. You don't need a pad. You don't need a recorder. Sit with the word and read it. Start in I said, God, where do I start? This is a serious conversation. He said, you start at the beginning like you do every other book and read. I said, okay. At the end of seven years, at the end of seven years, Holy Spirit said, close it. <laughs> I said, close it. <laughs> he said, close it. And when I close it, he said, I have reformatted your mind. Good God Almighty. Woo! <laughs> I have reformatted your mind. Where do I start? At the beginning. Now I understand when Paul says in Galatians, let the Holy Spirit, I take out the article, let Holy Spirit guide your life. Woo! That 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 is so big. Now I understand why that's not happening after spirit baptism. Because this war between our worldview and Holy Spirit, this war between our worldview and Holy Spirit. Our, this war between our inner being and our outer being, our spirit baptized me and our normal me is constantly fighting against each other because we have not established a God view, a God view. We don't, we fight, we don't fight based on a God view. We fight based on a personal view. We disagree on the level of opinions and personal philosophies. But if we all had a God view, <laughs> oh <Ooh. laughs> my God, Jessica, absolutely. She said, right now I need audio to help me read, but I'm in faith that well before Holy Spirit instructs me to stop, I'll be reading. Absolutely. I'm standing in agreement with you. You need audio to help you and you're reading from the text. Baby, I stand with you. Get it. Get it done. Get it done. Get it done. I'm standing with you in Jesus' name. <laughs> Woo! And it took me seven years. Seven years. And when you began to read the whole Bible, what is happening is a revelation of God. The Bible is the revelation of God. <laughs> Woo, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Through the revelation of God, the scriptures connect believers to God, connects human beings to God. The scriptures are God revealing himself revealing himself to furnish mankind with the revelation of his love. To furnish mankind with the revelation of redemption. Somebody is writing these down. To furnish mankind or humankind to furnish us the revelation of redemption, but first of God's love of redemption, of how God thinks, moves, operates. <laughs> and I 
I'm telling you, when it's all said and done, and that scriptures will, you know, pop up and they'll be so enlightening. You're going to preach different. You're going to think different. You're going to live different. You're going to make your decisions differently. Because you're going to begin to see things the way God sees things. You'll begin to see how God has interacted with man. You'll begin to see how sin altered the revelation of God. And how God furiously, recklessly, extravagantly had to repair and had to redeem what sin altered. And most of the scriptures have to do with a time in which sin had altered the culture and the behavior of man. Most of the Old Testament is about a time and context where sin and disobedience had altered culture. That's why when you throw a scripture up at me from the Old Testament, I say, hold it, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> when, when we throw scriptures at each other, you have to take into consideration the context of those scriptures. I don't care if it does say what you think it's going to say to support what you believe. You got to understand how these scriptures are, are written, how it's, how it's set up. Most of scripture is parenthetical. Good God Almighty. Woo, it's parenthetical. What does that mean, Bishop? It means that it's a parenthesis to God's indigenous plan. God's indigenous plan is only found basically in the first two chapters of the first book. Everything else is parenthetical. Even the coming of Jesus is parenthetical. <laughs> Even the coming of Holy Spirit is parenthetical. It is, it, is, it is because of what happened in Genesis 3 that now we have to have judges and kings and we have to have a savior and we have to have Holy Spirit. But God's indigenous plan is really found in only two chapters of the Bible. And that's Genesis chapter one and chapter two. That's God's indigenous plan. Good God almighty. Woo, is anybody hearing me? The rest of it is basically parenthetical. It, 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 is, it, is, it is only to, to redeem what sin had altered. And you won't know this until you get into the book. <laughs> oh, shit came out my heart. So when you're looking at scripture, you have, to, you have to begin to say, wow, this is all because of sin. All of the killings, all of the wilderness wanderings, all of the captivities, all of the, the responses of people and how God and the law and all of that is parenthetical. God's indigenous plan is only found in two chapters of the Bible. And that's Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Everything else is an add-on. Everything else is to correct what sin had altered. Oh, Shabbat. Hallelujah. <laughs> Is anybody hearing me? I'm telling you right now. And so we, 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 we are looking through the lenses of scripture many times. And we're trying to use a sin altered context to correct something or to identify or to define something that it really doesn't define. And so if you don't read and get down in there so God can show you how he dealt with it, so you can see the nature of God, you can see uh, the integrity of God, you can see the love of God, you can see how God's attributes were always applied in certain situations. Then even after you are baptized in Holy Spirit, you don't have anything the Holy Spirit to latch on to. Whoa. 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 So sin 
altered the revelation of God. Sin altered the revelation of man. Sin altered the revelation of culture. Sin. So get everything else had to come back to try to redeem it, to try to fix it, to try to, to adjust it back to God's indigenous plan. The coming of Jesus is parenthetical. The coming of Holy Spirit is parenthetical. Can you imagine what happened in Genesis 1 and 2? Look at God. Look at God. I tell my Bible school students, if you knew the Bible, chapter 1 and 2 of Genesis, everything else is going to get clear for you. If you understand the revelation of Genesis, chapter number 1 and chapter number 2, I got a church in St. Pete called Genesis. If you understood just Genesis chapter one and two, everything else in the Bible would clear up. Everything else would, would clear up. The, the, the battle of gender would clear up if you understood Genesis one and two. The battle of leadership would clear up if you understood Genesis one and two. The battle of lifestyles and orientations would clear up if you just understood God in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. <laughs> Everything in your life would clear up because that's God's indigenous original plan. That God would have total access to his creation through humankind. That God would be able to see himself in the earth through humankind is in Genesis 1 and 2. And that everything that God had created was managed and was stewarded the way he intended. It's in Genesis 1 and 2. God's intimacy, God's fellowship with us, where God would come in the cool of the day and walk in the garden. And, and the Bible says the sound of the Lord, the sound of God would come and commune. That's Holy Spirit. Long before Pentecost. That's Genesis 1 and 2. You see the love of God. Even in Genesis 3. In correction. You see. But everything after 3. Is parenthetical to that. Ooh, 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 ooh. I'm trying to help you to understand. And this is why when preachers be preaching. I just listen to them. Say, my God, they don't have a clue what they're talking about. It sounds good. People shouting, people enjoying it. But this is just as crazy as it can be. Because they don't know God. Not God of the Bible. They know the God they've already made up in their mind. Or the God that someone handed them. And this is where the danger of spirit baptism is. Is that when you have believers who have been spirit baptized, but don't have a biblical worldview. That's a problem. That is a problem. I want you to go back to Matthew chapter number three for just a moment. Matthew chapter three. <laughs> Woo, glory to God. Matthew chapter number three. My God. And and, and we read it, but I, I want you to see this uh, because it's so important. Let's look at verse 11. John says, I baptize in water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I. So much greater than I'm not worthy even to be his slave or carry his sandals. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Good God Almighty. Woo, glory to God. He is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork. Then he will clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat into his barn, but burning the chaff with never ending fire. Now that's John's sermon. Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. <laughs> John tried to talk him out of it. I am the one who needs to be baptized by you. 
This is his cousin. So you know he knows him, right? <laughs> he knows his cousin. This is his cousin. He says, no, you need to do this so that we can carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. Look at verse 16. And so after his baptism, watch this, Jesus came up out of the water and the heavens were open. And John saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. Good God Almighty. Can, 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 I, can I just, will you give me a little liberty in the scriptures here with wording? I want, I want you to just hear this. And after his baptism, verse 16, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened. <laughs> Hallelujah. And John saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and attaching to him. <laughs> Woo-wee. Woo-wee. I need you to hear this. I need you to hear this. And attaching, attaching himself, attaching so Holy Spirit, Jesus is being baptized by John. John baptizes Jesus in water. But now God in heaven, Father, Yahweh, Jehovah, he now releases Holy Spirit to attach to the word. Ooh. Why? so that he could carry out all that God requires. I need you to look at that verse 15. It has to be done so that I can carry out all that God requires. Folks, listen to me. You cannot do this except there is a connection as a believer. Now, Holy Spirit draws everybody. Holy Spirit is drawing. Holy Spirit is superintending the affairs of the world. Holy Spirit is a, 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 a superintending the affairs of mankind, of humankind, all over the world. But when you become a believer and you experience spirit baptism, now after spirit baptism, Holy Spirit has come upon you and has attached itself to your confession of Christ. Holy Spirit has come upon you and attached himself to your confession of Christ. Are you following me? That's your faith confession. When we baptize you in water, in obedience, uh, based upon your confession to the Great Commission, in obedience, we baptize you. Now, Holy Spirit attached himself to your faith confession in Christ. Spirit baptism came upon you and you received power. Now, after that experience, what is Holy Spirit working with in our lives? All right, so we got our confession of faith. He attached and came upon you because of your confession of faith in Christ. But after spirit baptism, after spirit baptism, now there must be progressive revelation that Holy Spirit must begin to work with through your life. Whew. Hallelujah. Woo, shakaba. In the text, this is what Holy Spirit showed me. I'd never seen it before. Holy Spirit connected to the word. Holy Spirit connected to the living word. That the living word needed Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit needed the living word. This, this I, I need you to understand this. I, 
I need you to see how this works. Holy Spirit doesn't attach to your opinions. Holy Spirit does not attach to your sin altered nature. Holy Spirit does not attach itself to your perspectives. Holy Spirit does not connect. It connects to the word in you. Ooh, shakaba. Holy Spirit must connect to the word in me. Mm. Uh, ooh, shakaba. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit must connect to the word in me. Holy Spirit cannot connect to my, uh, my, my depression or my, my evilness or my, my madness. No, Holy Spirit connects to the word in me. Holy Spirit is here to help me execute this word in the earth. Holy Spirit must connect to God in me. Holy Spirit must connect to God in me. So I have to ask the question, how much God is there in me? Because the greater the measure of God in us, the greater the measure of Holy Spirit's demonstration in us. It's not that we have not received spirit baptism, but our progressive revelation of God is so small. And you cannot use Holy Spirit as a substitution for ignorance. You cannot. Holy Spirit doesn't compensate for our ignorance. Holy Spirit, how much of God in you? If you had God in you, you wouldn't have to keep talking about holiness. You're trying to get people to be holy from an external experience. No, it has to be an internal knowledge of God. When you see who God is, you will know how clean, how pure God is. And if you love God, you'll keep his commandments. But how can you love who you don't know? That was the problem in John 4. She said, we worship. She said, what are you talking about? We worship. And Jesus said, you do. But you worship who you don't know. Oh, God. How many of us worship a God we don't know? How many people in, the, in, the, in our churches worship God and don't know God? How many, how many children know God? How many of your children know God? How many of your grandchildren know God? We worship who we don't know. Good God Almighty. You're not saying nothing to me. This was the problem. This is the problem. This was the problem in John chapter number four. Come on here. I need you to hear this. <laughs> I need you to understand what, what Jesus is talking to. <laughs> you, you have to understand why he's talking to her and what is he saying to her? She said, we worship. And Jesus responds, but you worship a God you don't know. <laughs> you go to church every Sunday and don't know God. You preach and don't know God. You know scripture. You know ministry, but you don't know God. Oh, me. Hi, Shekha. Tama no Shekha. Woo, Shekhi Baba. The more you know him, the less the worship team has to work. The less the preacher has to work. The, 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 we, don't, we don't have to sing five songs and vamp it 20 times. That the, when we know God, hallelujah, when we know him, 
We don't even need a song. But we're worshiping who you don't know. Ooh, Shakaba. The Father is looking for those in chapter 4. Hallelujah of John. God is spirit. And the Father is looking for those who worship him in spirit and truth. How can you worship a God? And you don't know him. In spirit and truth. Oh, Shakaba. Oh, Rabba Bashekata Baba Shata. You don't know who you're worshiping. You, you, you worshiping a mimic. You're mimicking worship. You, 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 you're mimicking what you see the Jews do. But Samaritans, you, you have not had a visitation from God. So you are mimicking worship. You're mimicking in your mountain. What you see Jews do in their mountain. Many, many believers are mimicking, mimicking what you see the worship team do. Mimicking what you see the bishops do. Mimicking what you see your pastor do. But what is your knowledge of God personally? And not my experience. Not No, experience is a horrible teacher. Experience doesn't teach us God. Then you don't want to learn God through experience. You want to learn God through the revelation that he has ordained. And that gives Holy Spirit something to attach to. I got to go, Lord have mercy. Hallelujah, Shale, God bless you. The Father is looking for those who worship in spirit and in truth. Oh, God, have mercy in an emotion. Oh, God, have mercy. Oh, God, have mercy. Have mercy. Oh, God, have mercy. Oh, looking for those who worship him in spirit and truth. And when you don't have truth, oh God, have mercy. Have mercy, have mercy. Have mercy, have mercy. Have mercy, have mercy. That's why scriptures say, what would it profit Gain the whole world and lose your soul. So how did this happen? I gotta lose my soul. I preached, I pastored, I worshiped, I served. But you never knew me. That's that that Luke 7 said. We cast out devils. We healed the sick. And the Lord responds, but I never knew you. Have mercy. Have mercy. Hey, listen, I got to go. I, I get caught up over in this class, and I don't, I don't, I'm so I, I I'm telling you, this this is in my spirit so deeply that we we gotta do this right. We can't just be tongue-talking liars. We can't be tongue-talking fornicators. We can't be tongue-talking arguers and mean meanies and snooties. We can't be tongue-talking, tongue-talking and, and living in sin. We can't be tongue-talking and, and cussing each other out. We can't be tongue-talking and still crooked and still, no, come on, folks. Listen, I'm going to ask you. We can't be. Son, we can't be. Be 
leadership we can't be. We can't be tongue talking schizophrenics. We can't be tongue talking mentally ill, depressed, schizophrenic, multiple personality people, spirit baptized, adulterers. We can't be spirit baptized thieves and liars. Spirit baptized, mean husbands and 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 loose women. We know, no. We speak in tongues. You can't be spirit baptized and depressed. You're gonna have to decide. I will give Holy Spirit something to work with. I will give Holy Spirit something to work with. I'm going to put some time in with God. And the more I know this, the revelation of God, this is where he has planted his revelation. We don't read this to preach. We don't read this to sing. We don't read this to pray. We don't read this to stop sinning. We don't read this to do that. We read this for the revelation of God. I got to give Holy Spirit something to work with. I got to go, folks. I love y'all. <laughs> Woo! I said that twice, didn't I? Got to go. <laughs> I want you to leave and I want you to put this as you go. I'm going to give Holy Spirit more to work with. I'm going to give Holy Spirit more to work with. Gotta go. Love y'all.